Hey everyone, welcome back to another Animal Room Tour. For those of you who are new here, my name is Tanner. I've been keeping exotic animals, namely amphibians, reptiles, and fish, for almost 17 years now. With that said, the purpose of Serpa Design is to show you how I bring nature indoors, as well as inspire and teach you how to do the same things. Because with a little bit of practice, patience, and hard work, anybody can do the things that you're going to see me do on this channel. Without any delay, let's go on a tour. For starters, I'm going to bring you on over to my new designated storage area. If you saw the last Animal Room tour, I didn't have this at the time, and a lot of what you see was actually in my room itself. This was a really important feature for me to continue the growth of what I'm doing here and to provide more projects for you guys on the channel. So I'm going to show you what I got going on in here. So we'll start out at the bottom here and basically this is all just storage stuff that I don't typically use on a day to day basis. So here I have all my supplies for cleaning out the fish tanks. It's a bunch of empty buckets and there's some more buckets here. My nets, gravel vacs, all kinds of different stuff, airline tubing. And over in here, that's all ABG mix. I got sand in here and orchid bark back there. And then this is just a bunch of random stuff. I got towels in here. It's good to have those whenever you're doing stuff with water a lot. Biodegradable planters aquascaping substrate and this is all just containers for culturing springtails down there and now to the next level up we have some containers for making terrariums my tool chest and both of these actually are more jars and different things that i use to make terrariums over here i just have some miscellaneous things some cvpc pipes and uh, some cool twigs that I'm going to be using for a really interesting vivarium build here in a couple of weeks. Also a fluorescent light and another PVC pipe. Now moving on to this shelf, this is whenever things start to get a little bit more interesting. I have all springtails over in here. These are my personal cultures that I use for my vivariums. And then I have other cultures that you'll see later on which are eventually going to stock the store of my website. but. I'm not going to be selling those just yet, so be patient with me on that. And over here I got water treatment, some Rapashi crested gecko diet, and then calcium powder. And then this is pre-measured crested gecko food. Whenever you have as many animals as I do, you want to be as efficient as possible. And a lot of you guys have commented on how organized I am. And I think that's really important as well to be clean and organized so that way you need something, something goes wrong, you can just get what you need right away and get the matters taken care of as quickly as possible. So with this, rather than clean out a bowl and all that sort of thing, I can just fill this up with water, mix it up, put it in the Crested Gecko's tanks and then leave it in there for a day, day and a half, maybe two days at the most take it out and then put in a new one. And now moving on over to the right, we have my isopod cultures. I have dwarf whites down here. And then this is a temperate species of ones that I've been cultivating just from in my backyard. And they're breeding pretty strong right about now. And I'll show you each culture individually. Then moving on over to the right, you'll see I downsized significantly on my cricket cultures. And the reason that I did that was because I just felt like a lot of them were getting wasted and I've adopted a lot of alternative food sources since the last time. So really, I just buy as many as I need. I'll have them for two weeks, three weeks, use them all up. This way it's less casualties, less mess. And overall, it's just better this way for me, at least that you might have more success having a lot of crickets. But for me, it's better off to have only a few of them. And then moving on over to the right here, I have this nice piece of driftwood. I'm still debating on what exactly I want to use it for, but I'm thinking that I want to put it in this flower terrarium or well, actually, this is a flower aquarium, but um, I want to make a terrarium in here. And I think this is a pretty nice piece for in here. And then over here, I just got 
some rice for my springtail cultures, a bunch of empty containers. And then these are the springtail starter cultures. I think about half of these I have going and then the rest are just empty charcoal. I just gotta stock them with the springtail. So eventually those will become the cultures that I will sell to you guys. And I wanna get a lot of them going before I start to sell. So that way I'm not gonna run out of stock or anything like that. This is where I keep all of my plants. This is a really cheap and effective solution that I've found for keeping plants. Rather than having a bunch of aquariums or different things like that, you can just have a couple of these Tupperware containers. They have a little foam gasket in them and they retain humidity extremely well. So these are replicating our vivarium and terrarium environment as is. So the plants are becoming acclimated in here. We also have the quarantine factor going on which is always a good idea because you don't know where your plants have been prior to you getting them. And overall, it's you could get all your plants ahead of time, meticulously plan out your builds, and then take whatever you need and propagate the rest. And I'm gonna condense both of these into one since these plants are already quarantined and they're ready to go. And these two will be empty at that point. So I'm getting a ton of new plants for a ton of new terrarium builds and vivarium builds and all that sort of thing. I know what I want to get already, but if you guys have any suggestions on plants that you'd like to see me use, definitely let me know and I'll get what I can. And now I'm moving on to my designated moss shelf. You guys know me by now, I like some moss. So I have a whole shelf dedicated to it and I have a bunch of different kinds in here. This is all Java moss in here. Actually, there's a straggler of anacris over there as well, which isn't, isn't moss, but all java moss in here there's a couple of snails as well and i just have it on an led bulb which is definitely doing the trick because i never run out of this stuff and i use it quite a lot moving on over to this one this is all the same mosses that you guys saw last time there might be a few new ones but by and large it's the same ones that were in that little 10 gallon aquarium and having it like this makes more sense because the moss isn't getting so tall that i need this really tall enclosure for it these ones are cool because they're about know, seven, eight inches tall max, which is cool because I can maximize my space over here. But anyways, I have sphagnum moss here, fern moss. It's not really growing like the ferns yet, but that's definitely what that is. Little bit of liverwort left. I used most of that up. Pillow moss in the back and a couple of other species that I'm not entirely sure what they are. Now we're going to move on to the top and final shelf. And this is the alternative food source that I had mentioned a little bit ago whenever I was discussing the crickets. And this was a big game changer for me. Basically what I got up here is a culture of about, mm, I don't know, maybe 200 dubia roaches. And this, they're, they're excellent. They have no smell to them. Or I can't say no smell. They smell a little bit, but it's not, it's not a bad smell. It's just like earthy. They are very easy to care for, low maintenance. They eat a lot less than crickets. They create less waste than crickets. And overall, there's just a lot more advantages to keeping these than crickets. <laughs> and that, that's as much as I got to say about that. Here's some babies. Those are nice, that's as big as they, or well, I should say as small as they ever are. They're nice because I can feed those to my fire belly toads and other smaller animals. And my goal is to just get off of crickets completely. I don't know if I'll ever actually do that. It's a goal of mine, but we'll see what happens. And just overall, these are more nutritional food source as well, but there's not really much else that I want to say about that. If you guys want to see how I culture these and how you can do it at home yourself, and if it's something that you would like me to sell eventually, I can definitely do that as well. Just let me know in the comment section below. And one more thing that I want to say, this is a little trick of mine. Rather than, these guys need to be at a relatively warm temperature, and rather than having a heating pad under here, I have a CFL bulb in here, so this is creating enough heat underneath of the enclosure to keep it warm. So this is kind of like a win-win. I'm using this to light my moss and it also is heating my Dubia roach culture. So that's a good way to kind of save money and resources and all that sort of things. And so now I'll take you out into the main room. And so this is it, Serpa Design Headquarters. This is where all the magic happens. This is also where I keep all of my animals. But before we get into all of this, I wanna take you on over to here. 
For those of you who didn't like the Dubia Roaches, not to worry, we've got our designated Dubia Roach Slayer, MJ the Bullfrog. And MJ here is a total character. As you see right now, he thinks he's hiding. We don't see him, right? We see him. But anyways, he is our designated Dubia Roach Slayer. He is just, he'll, he'll munch them till I stop putting them in there. He loves them. And it's so much easier for me to say every other day or every two days, feed him 10 Dubia Roaches as opposed to 50 to 80 crickets and th that's how it was. I would have to feed him so many crickets A lot of them would die from jumping in the water and it just was a total pain The only downside to feeding him the roaches is that I have to clean the tank more frequently because he's creating more waste but it's not really a big deal because I would rather him be healthier than You know feeding him a bunch of crickets and potentially not having him get enough food and the cool thing about MJ is that I raised him up from a tadpole about nine and a half years ago. And if you ever get the opportunity to get yourself a tadpole and raise it up to an adult frog, it's a really cool experience. It's just really rewarding because to start out with a little tadpole and then end up with a huge adult male bullfrog that calls all the time and eats like a champ, it's just, it's a really cool thing. <laughs> And now we're moving on over to my 90 gallon freshwater aquarium. This isn't gonna be here for much longer. And the reason is that all of these fish are gonna move into the 150 gallon that you'll see in a little bit. But anyways, I have a really eclectic blend of fish in here. My current stock includes eight silver dollars, three lace catfish, two weather loaches, two bristlenose plecos, one green sunfish, one banjo catfish, two African clawed frogs, and one pearl gourami. Like I said before, it's a rather eclectic blend. I know it doesn't really make sense, but basically I'm just keeping fish that I like that more or less work in a community setting. And today is bloodworm feeding day, so I'll throw these bloodworms in here and just show you a little feeding footage. And now I'll bring you on over to this side of the room to meet my king snake, Houdini. So what you're looking at here is a 150 gallon cube aquarium that has a custom stand and canopy on it. Originally this was intended for a snapping turtle that I used to have. Unfortunately she passed away so my king snake is momentarily living in here. And you're probably wondering where he is. And right now I just have him in this bag because I just cleaned out his setup. So Dean here is a blotched king snake. I raised him up from a youngster. And the reason he's named Houdini is because he pulled a little escape act on me when I first got him. 
And long story short, he was gone for a couple of months and then I found him outside under a garbage can. And this type of snake doesn't live in my area, so I know for a fact that it was definitely him and the, the markings and everything were consistent as well. And as I had stated, he's only momentarily living within this enclosure and that's because he was never intended to live in it in the first place. But anyways, I'm gonna tear apart the entire construction, not the tank obviously, but the canopy, I'm gonna take that apart. I'll keep these faux stained glass doors because I like them, but definitely I'm done with canopies. After this, I realized that I hate them. This is the first one I've ever had, last one I'll ever have. I don't like them at all. And the stand, I'll keep the painted doors, or well, the actual painting part, not the door, and I'll redo all of the facade on it because I have power tools now so I can make that look a lot nicer than it did. And I also want the stain to match my other stands. With that said, where is Dean gonna go? Well, I've been talking about this for a few years now, and those of you who've been with the channel for a while, you know that I've been talking about doing a custom snake build. And basically what I'm gonna do is make a tank completely from scratch and then set it up naturalistically. And then we're gonna put him in there. And I think he's gonna really enjoy it, obviously. And this build is gonna answer a lot of your questions on housing snakes in a naturalistic enclosure. Their requirements are a lot different than say a dart frog. So therefore the enclosure must be set up in a particular manner that is safe for snakes. He is a pinnacle example of what a snake will act like if it's tamed. These guys are the, some of the calmest animals that you'll ever encounter. They don't wanna hurt you. Nothing like that. And of course, snakes are maybe next to sharks are the most misunderstood animals. And it's largely learned behavior. I think there is an innate fear of snakes and humans, but to a large extent, it's learned behavior. If you're afraid of snakes, go out, find somebody who has a snake like this, hold it, get over your fears and get on with your life because you can't spend your life being afraid of this. Look at this guy. He is harmless as harmless could be. And now I'll bring you on over to the right where I have a few new additions. We'll start on top here with my Twin Tail Half Moon Beta. I had been wanting to get a Beta for a little while and when I got this one, it was actually a little bit of a spontaneous event. Basically what had happened was I had to go pick up my fiance from a business trip and I got to where I had to pick her up from a lot earlier than I had anticipated. So naturally I went to the pet store just to look around and I saw him and of all the betas I was looking at, he was really excitable and just looked like he had a lot of life in him. So I wanted to get him while he was healthy and I brought him home and that was maybe about two months ago and he's doing pretty strong. You might be wondering what the heck is going on with this setup and trust me it's not supposed to look nice I just was putting a few plants in there to try to see how they would work in a riparium setting however my intent is to rescape this in a few weeks I'd like to make it look really nice and get additional fish for in here I'm not really sure yet what I would include with him or if it would just be something as simple as a female beta I, I'm not really sure what I'm thinking at this time but I definitely would like to include some more fish and make this setup look a lot nicer. And of course I'll do a video on that. I really enjoy this beta. He's got a lot of character as most betas do. And at first he could not swim in this enclosure at all because of the way that the current is. But now that he's got his sea legs, he swims around here like a champ. I also have about eight Nerite snails in here and they do an excellent job eating away any melted plants. So if you're doing stuff with aquatic plants and you notice that they're melting a good bit, it's definitely a good idea to get yourself some Nerite snails because they will take care of this without you even having to do anything. Now move on down here to the bottom. There's nothing to speak about in terms of the setup of this enclosure. It's just a standard 10 gallon aquarium with a ton of foliage in it and a few sticks. But it's who's in here that I wanna show you guys. So here's my new crested gecko that I got back in October. I haven't held her very much, so she's still a little bit finicky in terms of being handled. And she has beautiful colors. That's one of the reasons why I got her. I was 
looking at all the other ones and this one really stood out to me. When I got her, she was probably about the size of her tail. So she's about doubled in size since when I got her and I, I really wish I would have taken progress pictures, but I just for whatever reason didn't have the time to do it or didn't feel like doing it at the time. And I'm really terrible at coming up with names, so I still haven't named her yet. And I posted a picture of her on Instagram and a lot of people gave me some pretty solid suggestions, but I still haven't decided on anything. So if any of you have some good ideas on what to name her, definitely let me know. Moving on over to the right once more, here's a rack that I built a couple of months ago. It was built specifically to accommodate all of these vertical vivariums and originally I had another shelf up on top of this but I decided that it was a little bit too bulky and there was really no need to have it so I chopped it off and now I just use the top for storage. And basically what I've got on here is two jumbo springtail cultures. I'm not going to pull them down and show you them but basically there's a ton of springtails in there and they're nice because they're not tall but there's a lot of surface area so there's a lot of breeding room for the springtails in there. Then on the next level up, I have some shipping supplies, mainly just heat packs for whenever I ship things out in the cold weather. And up top here, I have this awesome piece of driftwood. I found this about a year ago and thankfully I haven't used it on anything yet. I feel like this is what I wanna use for in my betas tank, but I'm not totally sure about that. I mean, this piece, it's crazy, look at that. I've never seen another piece of driftwood like this, and chances are I'll never see another one like it. So whatever I use it for, it's gotta be good. If you guys have any suggestions, definitely let me know. And then this container has just a bunch of miscellaneous supplies in it, so lighting fixtures, water bowls, heating pads, different things that I've had over the years for my reptiles and fish. And up top we have a box full of paper towel rolls and toilet paper rolls. If you saw earlier, that's what I keep my dubia roaches and crickets in. And obviously I keep those because they're, they're cheap and I'm just reusing stuff from within the house. But I also think they provide more surface area than the egg cartons. And that's just my personal preference, but it's a good way to reuse materials and not waste anything. And this container has a bunch of smaller containers in it and this one has planting supplies like planters. Now on to the next shelf down. These are the two vivariums from the vertical vivarium series and I have two more over here that I haven't finished yet so I have them covered up because I'm not ready to do the reveal just yet. But these are doing pretty well. This is the original conversion and overall it's doing pretty well. There were a couple of casualties uh, some expected, some unexpected. As you can see up top, the bromeliad is doing great. There's a lot of redness going on. The ones down here, however, don't really have as much redness. So I think what I'm going to do is trim the pup off of this one and put that pup in here and then trim this pup and put it over here and then take this one out entirely and put a different plant back in here that will grow up to here. And then same thing over here, since this bromelia that was closest to the ground, it started to get pretty bad, so I just took it out. And what I'm going to do is put another type of plant back in here that will grow up tall and cover in these spots. So what my idea is, is just have a bunch of bromeliads up top since they're not getting enough light down in here. And I don't want to change the lighting situation that I have because most of these plants down here are low light plants. And this is a Cryptanthus nubicola, and you can tell that it's getting enough light because it's starting to get this nice pinkish color in here, and it will have a pinkish brown color once it gets fully mature. And the mosses are just starting to take off. I think it took a while for them to kind of get established, but they're definitely starting to grow. And this patch, especially here, is doing real nice. The creeping fig is about to shoot off as well. It's actually attached into the soil with roots which is good and this whole piece here is all new growth and once you get about an inch of growth on the stalks that seems to be whenever it starts to really creep throughout the enclosure overall i like how this is doing but i still have a few things that i want to tweak and once i'm kind of set on the look of it that's whenever i'll put inhabitants in it and that's one of the reasons why i wait a while to put creatures in my vivarium so it's because 
I want to make sure that all of the plants are doing what they should, that I like how it looks, and I'm sure that I won't really go through and change things once the animals are in there. It's fine to do that beforehand, but you only stress out your animals if you're coming in here and doing all kinds of stuff when they're in there. I also have a 50 millimeter fan in here, which turns on every two hours for 15 minutes, I wanna say, and it passively circulates the air in here. And the reason that I do it that way is I don't wanna lose any of my humidity, and I say that after I've had it open for a while. It's not really a big deal right now because I don't have any inhabitants in here, but whenever they're in there, I don't wanna lose any of this hard-earned humidity. So rather than pull a bunch of clean air from outside into here, I'd rather just circulate the humid air that's already in there. So that way the air's not getting stagnant, but we're not losing the humidity either. And that will keep all of the plants growing nicely, prevent mold buildup and anything like that. And now onto this vivarium, there's not really much to say since I just uploaded it and I have to miss it for the day. I haven't done it just yet, but it's doing very well. These Slaginellas are actually already rooting into the background and the moss up here has taken quite nicely. And the ficus pumula as well is growing a bunch of new leaves on it. So this is doing really well right off the bat. I think this one's gonna grow in a lot faster than this one did. And that's all right, it, it's all dependent on the type of plants that you have and the way it's laid out and whatnot. But by and large, I like how both of these are doing. And as I had explained earlier, there's two more going in here and they're way different than these two in terms of the background styles and kind of how they're gonna be planted as well. I think you guys are really going to enjoy these, but that's enough about that. We'll move on to the next shelf down. A lot of you guys ask me about my lighting and if you're not housing any reptiles or anything like that, you can get away with using just standard LED bulbs like this. These are both at 5,000 Kelvin and they run at nine and a half watts. And as you can see, they're definitely doing the job the only thing is that your best bet is to use full spectrum lighting for any type of plant. It will just give you the best growth. And once I finish the other two vivariums, that's what I'm going to do. I'll just get a big 48 inch single full spectrum light to go over the top of them so that it's less wires and hassle and things like that. Now we'll move on down to the bottom shelf, which is accommodated for 20 long vertical vivariums. These two I haven't converted yet and I'm not probably going to do it for a little while. I think this one will house my other crested gecko and then I'm thinking maybe to get dumpy whites from the other one. Don't hold me to that. I might change this completely and not even use the 20 longs anymore. But in time, I'll make my decision on that. But we'll move on over to Henry. And Henry's vivarium is set up exactly the same as the ones above it in terms of lighting. I just have that 40 watt light in here. And the reason being that crested geckos don't need ultraviolet lighting, so there's no reason to have that. And I wanted to have a sort of canopy feel, so it could be dark down here and then light up here. This calathea here obviously grows really large, probably too large for the enclosure. So all that I do is just occasionally snip some leaves off. And then after I've trimmed all of my plants, I just put them down in here like so. And in time, those will decompose and fertilize the plants and so on and so forth. Henry definitely enjoys this new enclosure, but I had a few issues with it. Whenever I had initially put him in here, I didn't touch him for probably about a month and a half or two months. And that's because whenever you move a reptile into a new enclosure, a lot of times it can stress them out. So rather than bother him or anything like that, I just put him in here and not that I forgot about him, but I didn't want to handle him or anything just because I wanted him to become acclimated to this. But in doing so, I basically made him forget about being handled. So he turned into a feral Henry so basically I'm still like reacclimating him to being handled and he's pretty much back to where he was, but he might seem a little bit more jumpy than he was initially. And one of the other reasons I think this is, is in this enclosure, he probably feels a lot more secure since there's coverage everywhere and he's hiding right back in here. But when I take him out, he's going to feel exposed. 
So he's going to try to run away most likely. And so that's the Henry we know, chilled and relaxed. It's just whenever I first pull him out of there, I think it's a shock from being in his natural environment, so to speak, and then he's being handled. He just doesn't know what to do at first. And now that he's been sitting here for a little while, he knows that I'm not going to hurt him. He's like, okay, this, I, I remember this. Or that's what I like to think at least. You didn't see it all because I cut out the footage, but I've been holding Henry now for about 10 minutes. And that's usually about as long as I'll hold him before I put him back in his enclosure. So just let him go back in on his own. Close it up. Now I'll bring you on over to my goldfish tank. This is actually MJ's tank and I'm letting these goldfish grow out prior to putting him in here. So in the meantime, it's simply just a goldfish tank. And whenever I first got these guys, obviously they were feeder fish and I had about 20 of them. And even though I looked through the tank and tried to select the healthiest ones I could see, inevitably a little bit more than half of them died. From my perspective, I think it's a total shame that by and large, these fish are viewed as worthless and dirty feeder fish that are not good for anything or that no serious aquarist would ever keep them. My whole point is that these fish are a viable animal to keep and there's no reason that they should be traded the way that they are in terms of the crowded and dirty feeder fish tanks because that's not how these fish are if you keep them. They're not gonna just magically make your tank filled with filth in no time. If you are actually taking care of them properly, they're not as dirty as you probably think they are. And long term, obviously this 55 gallon isn't a suitable home for them. This is more or less just a grout tank that will probably only house them for about another year. I of course am prepared for the long term commitment to provide an adequate home for them. And if you do not have the space or the money or anything like that to house these guys, don't do it. There's no reason why you should try to keep any animal that you're not prepared to keep for the long term. And finally, I'll bring you on over to what you typically see in the background of most of my videos, my 125 gallon vivarium. This is something that I've been working on for several years. It's about six, six and a half years old. So the growth is really nice and I've, I've changed lighting over time, various plants. So it doesn't look like how it did whenever I first set it up, but it's basically been the same construction. I've just been messing around with this and this was more or less just a big science experiment of mine. I have a big variety of plants in here that really doesn't make sense. And that's pretty much just because I've been testing a bunch of different plants over several years. So I have a bunch of different species of Cryptanthus. I have this nice Calathea up front, a bunch of Anubius Nanas. I also have two types of Ficus Pumula. We got the standard Ficus Pumula and also the Ficus Pumula quercifolia, otherwise known as oak leaf creeping fig. I also have moss and liverwort in here. Mostly it's just java moss. I don't really use the temperate species in here because that was before I had really got into using those and all kinds of different stuff. And obviously I have my fire bellied toads in here and my green tree frogs. You don't really ever see the tree frogs. They just kind of hide out in the ficus pumula. Occasionally you'll see them, but the fire bellied toads will always come out whenever I'm working on projects or really if anything's going on in the room, they are definitely curious. They want to know what's going on. And I know that a lot of you guys want to see how I maintain this and you want to know the care that goes into a setup like this. I'm not really going to go over any of that in this video because that could just be a half hour long video in itself just because there's a lot of different things that I do in here. Not that it's a difficult setup to maintain. In fact, it's probably one of my easiest setups to maintain and that's because of the size. I'll show you something that I do from time to time, which is trim the ficus pumula background. So this is what it looked like before I trimmed it. Then I had to go in and trim everything. And then this is what it looked like afterwards. And that's about a month of growth. And keep in mind that I'm using the same LED bulbs in here that I use on my other setups. And as you can see, they definitely do the job to grow plants. There's no question about it. And I'll conclude here. I hope that you guys really enjoyed this tour. I put a lot of hard work into it. And I know that when you go online and you see these animal room tours and different things like that, keep in mind that these people, they probably didn't get these collections overnight and it takes time to accrue a collection like this. I didn't get all of these big tanks yesterday and I've been doing this for a really long time as most of these other people that you're gonna see with big collections, they've been at it for a while too. 
So I know that it's easy whenever you first get the bug to go head first into this and you wanna get as many animals as you can, but it's really important to improve on your quality and gain as much knowledge as you can before you branch out into getting all of these animals because it's most likely it's gonna happen if, <laughs> for those of you who already sort of have it, you know what I'm talking about, but it happens and it's really important to know what you're doing and be as efficient as you possibly can when you keep this many animals. My goal has never been, nor will it ever be, to jam as many animals as I can into a single room. My goal is to provide the best possible care that I can for the animals that I have, while also enjoying them myself. Because obviously it could get to the point where you have too many animals and you're not able to fully enjoy them. And luckily I've been at this for a while, so my methodology is pretty efficient in the way that I care for my animals. That said, it really only takes me about 10 to 15 minutes each day to take care of all of this stuff. Now that doesn't include the weekly water changes and that sort of thing. Obviously that takes a good hour, hour and a half to do all of these tanks, but it's not a big deal and I don't have a problem doing it because obviously I want to provide good care for my animals. So if you're gonna get into all of this stuff, get knowledge, get experience before you start to keep this many animals. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you guys next time.